me just. And uh, so we have to get rid of wrong thinking uh, because it's dangerous and it can put us in a bad place. And one of the, the wrong thinking is this whole idea uh, that the God is at a distant um, distance. And we, we may know that we know the truth, but my experience is we're not always living that truth. So I want us to consider what is the truth on this, okay? So the truth in this, it, it, it started right back when um, Yahweh uh, decided to teach us what community looks like. There was a, a lot of a tribalism that was going on. There was a lot of warfare. There was a lot of fighting and killing and, and stuff that was uh, very disturbing to our creator who did not create us for that purpose. The downfall of humanity led to these things. And, and he chose to grow his own nation where he was going to um, teach and demonstrate what community looks like. And, and part of this was understanding that he um, was in their midst, that he was with them. That was the big thing, okay? It's the reason why he told them to keep their camp in order because he didn't want to walk around in a mess. They made sure, they had to make sure that they, they, they uh, you know, buried things after going to the bathroom because he's walking around in the midst and he doesn't want to see that. You know, these are the type of things that, and it was a constant reminder that he was in their midst. Um, the whole idea of the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was a reminder of his presence. And, and so we have this, it's a promise. Deuteronomy 31, 8, but the Lord is the one who is marching before you. He is the one who will be with you. He won't let you down. He won't abandon you. So don't be afraid or scared. And, and you can read through all the Old Testament scriptures, and it's incredible the number of times it has been promised uh, that he, he won't leave them. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's really important. And, then, and so then Jesus builds on this in, in Matthew 20, 20. He says, look. I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. I will be with you. Not, I'll be at a distance. I'll check in with you now and then. Not, well, I'll be, you know, I'll be watching over you. No, I will be with you every day. Every day. It should be clear for us, absolutely clear for us, according to the word, that he, he, he's always with us. We know it by experience that he's always with us. We just look at what we've experienced this morning, and it, it's an experience. I hope you guys hold on to this, that um, the needs of, of Bridget and her mom, you know, uh, we, we talked about, we spoke it, we spoke it out loud. Uh, people were praying last night and we, and we saw this where a heart that was hard was made tender uh, towards their, towards the need. And, and, and suddenly where they weren't willing to, to go to the hospital, now they're willing to go to the hospital. And, and, and Bridget, who has need for uh, contact and free renewal uh, this morning, who's running to her mom, of course, because she has to take care of her mom. And, and suddenly the Lord intervenes there and makes sure that the right person is, is taking care of mom um, so that Bridget's needs can also be taken care of. See how present he is? See, it, this isn't something that we had to pray about for, um, for weeks on end. This was something that he was occupied with now because this was the moment. This was the emergency. This is what needed to be taken care of now. That's how present he is. John 14, 20. This is what Jesus is saying. Saying, on, on that day you will know that I am in my Father. You are in me. And I am in you. See, we know this. I'm just, I'm just refreshing our memory here. I'm just refreshing what we already know. We know this. Our problem is the, the living it. In Luke 17, 22 to 23, Jesus is praying. 
and, and listen to this prayer. I've, I've given them the glory that you gave me so that they can be one just as we are one. That alone is amazing, but that's for another day. I'm in them. I'm in them. This is Jesus talking to his father. Statement of fact. I'm in them. And you are in me. So that means, you know, if the father is in Jesus and Jesus is in us, then the father and Jesus are in us, right? That's, there's other scripture that refers to that as well. So I'm in them and you are in me so that they will be made perfectly one. Then the world will know that you sent me and that you have loved them just as you loved me. See, Jesus being present in us is bigger than even us. It, Jesus being present in us is so that you and I could be one and then that the world would know, that the world would know. See, that's, it's so much bigger than us, but we have to experience the us part. We have to experience this us part. It's, uh, it's us living this truth. It's us living this, that all these other things come out of it, but it has to begin with us living this truth. So problem is we live a lie and we may not even recognize it. To be honest, um, sometimes we're not very good at evaluating things. We're not very good at evaluating ourselves, um, uh, except when we want to beat ourselves up. But we, we, don't, we don't necessarily sit down and look at our day and look at our attitudes and, and, and look at our relationship in, in all of this. So we can end up living a lie. Uh, so we know the truth, but we can see, but we can see that um, we live a lie by our attitude toward our Father. You know, so first of all, fear. Now, I'm not talking about that first reaction fear. That's that's normal. That's the fear that provokes the 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 fight or flight um, type of thing. Um, you know, so the, the fear has been given to us for for a reason. Um, but I'm talking about the long lived fear. I'm talking about the fear that you live with day in and day out. I'm talking about the fear that paralyzes you. I'm talking about the fear um, that clouds your thinking and, and everything else. Um, that type of fear, you know, we, we have that as if father doesn't know what he's doing or doesn't want to help, doesn't care. We can have that attitude, especially when we allow that fear to take root. Well, God doesn't care. Well, he may know. You know, I think most of us know that he knows. He actually is living it with us. We don't always stop and think about that. He's living it with us. But sometimes we, we can convince ourselves of the lie that, that he doesn't care. He doesn't care. Doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about my situation. And we also this thing when we when we are living the experience of a distant god when we are living that mentality we also slip into the self help mode where we try to take care of our own needs we we try you know we talk about Abraham and Sarah right <clears throat> they're fine examples of this they have that promise of the son uh, but it doesn't seem to be um, coming about so they decide to help God. And, and uh, so Sarah gives her, her um, handmaid to, to Abraham and uh, a son is born, but not, that's not the son of the promise. That's, that's the son of the effort. And, and, and that, Paul uses that later to, to explain um, things. So there's, there's lessons that, that are in there. Uh, but they, they needed the way. It, it wasn't for them to do. They weren't supposed to help themselves. And, and there are, are things in, in, in our life. If, if the Lord tells us to do something, that's, that's not self-help. He, he's telling us that we go, go ahead, do that. You know? um, but there are times that because we can, we do. And we credit it as, as God telling us to do that. No, that, that was just because it was convenient and we could do that. But he had actually had something much larger and better planned for us. And so we get in the way and we have that attitude. We have to do it on our own because our God is at a distance. And then there's the, the, the complaining attitude. Um, when we understand that, that 
that Jesus is walking through all of this with us and he's experiencing all of this with us and, and, and uh, he, he knows all this um, and that he's got us and that there are promises that are applied and we can trust him. Um, you know, complaining is the opposite of trust. We, we, we see that again with the Israelites in, in, in the desert and all their complaining. They, they complained about everything. They, they complained about uh, food. They complained about meat. They complained about water. They, <laughs> they just complained about everything. And there was just a lack of trust there. You know, um, it's, we, we complain as if Father has never done anything for us. And he'll never do anything for us. We complain as, as, as if he is a terrible supplier. He's a, a terrible provider. He neglects us. And yet when we stop and we look at our life and we write out our testimonies when we, and, and, and we look at what he did for us last week and we look at what he did for us in the last crisis and we look at the fact that we're still alive, we face all these things and we're still alive and, um, you know, and, and, and things are good. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. I want to focus on this. This is, this is a big thing for us. The problem in living with a distant God, um, with that mentality, with a distant God mentality, is, is we never seek his direction. And honestly, I mean, this week, just keep a, keep a journal just for the week. And at the end of the day, just, you know, write down how many conversations you've had with him, how, what you included him in. Uh, write down the decisions you made and, and whether these were, were directed by him or these just things seemed like a good idea, so you, so you did it. Like, just make yourself aware of how much you include him in, in your daily living and how much you exclude him. There, there are people who can go a month without having a conversation with the Lord and think they're okay. And we're lying to ourselves. If, if we think that we're okay, that we can have this, this relationship with the Lord with no intimacy, then, then all we're doing is, is we're treating him like a, a get out of jail free card. Uh, um, you know, four leaf clover or whatever other things or rabbit's foot or, or, or whatever. Like it, it's, it's not, this is, this is the danger of, of, of idols that, you know, idols aren't living. You, 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 you don't owe anything to them. You, you kind of keep them at a distance and, and uh, you, you honor them. So like, we'll go to church, we'll, we'll, we'll sing worship, but we're not actually worshiping. We'll, we'll sing it as if it's an offering but it's, it's not something where we're actually having conversation with him. Um, we, in fact, our, our minds might be wandering on other things. So I got to call this person. I got to do this. It's called vain worship. There's, there's, no, there's no depth. There's no, it's just, we, we may as well be singing a worship to a rock or, or, or something. Because there's, there's really nothing to it. it it's, that's the, the problem with the, the religious mindset. It's like we're earning something. Well, I'm going, I'm going to worship him so, so he doesn't get mad at me. I'm going to worship him so I can have a good week. I'm going, now you may not put it in those words, but just stop and consider. Let's honestly, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? There's a few lessons we can learn from Joshua. And, and these things, we, we've talked about these things. We've looked at these things. We, we've laughed over these things. And, and but I want us to do it again. I want us to go back here. Because I, I don't think COVID would just had a bad effect on our relationships with each other. I, I think it, it's also had a bad effect on our relationship with the Lord. Um, I think the enemy... Uh, has been able to insert uh, things into our thinking 
that that we need to really be aware of. And the only way we can be aware of it is to sometimes revisit some familiar ground, some lessons that we've already learned. And, and I really want us to consider this. How am I making my decisions? Is, is Jesus Christ really the center of my universe? Am I really honestly orbiting around him? Do I receive all my sustenance from him? Is all the wisdom coming from him? Is, is, is he's the source of everything for me? I want you to consider that, that Joshua received his mission. Don't be terrified or discouraged, Joshua. Lord, your God is with you. Moses. Moses spoke over Joshua a few times. The Lord spoke over Joshua a few times. Even the people spoke over Joshua a few times. It wasn't meaning some people have looked at that and said, oh, that meant that Joshua is full of fear. Not whatsoever. Uh, I don't think Joshua's full of fear, far from it. Uh, there's nothing in Joshua's actions that indicate to me that he was a man prone to fear at all. Are you kidding? He hung out with Moses. <laughs> you know, he, got a, he got to hang out in the tent of meeting. Moses would leave the tent of meeting, and Joshua stayed in the tent of meeting. You know, the, Joshua got to experience so much with Moses and received a portion of Moses' anointing. But this was... This was a reminder that, that all of his strength came from Yahweh. Everything came from Yahweh. Um, but he had been given a mission. He was taking Israel into the promised land, and he, he was going to occupy the promised land. They were evicting. They were destroying seven nations that dishonored the Lord for over 400 years. And we have no, um, it, it's not part of the history that has been given to us, how much warning and how much, how many prophets have been sent into these people. But, you know, it's, it's over 400 years because it was already bad when Abraham was there. And then it, it, it was 400 years of, of slavery as, as he grew this nation to come in. And he had told Abraham uh, when they have reached their peak when they're, they have reached their peak of evil, when they have reached their peak of um, depravity, when they have reached that peak of rebellion against me, I will send your descendants in to remove them. And, and so uh, this is the assignment that is now Joshua's. Moses got them there, but Joshua is now going to carry it out. You know, um, and he didn't look back. He didn't look back. He's going to destroy seven nations and occupy their land. And, and remember that the, 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 uh, the leader, the general of the Lord's army met with Joshua. Okay. And would have given Joshua the, the, the Jericho assignment, would have given him the instructions on, on how he was going to carry this out. So Joshua didn't think anything could cause um, a need for a course correction. That, that's, that, that was his failing. Uh, it's, it's like sometimes the people ha have the attitude when Jesus told us to go to the nations and make disciples. Right? And, and they think that's enough. And they don't look for the details. And so Joshua has, has his marching orders. Uh, and I'm sure he... He had such a trust in the Lord that, that he, you know, he didn't think that there'd be any need um, to check. So we know about Jericho, right? And Joshua followed those orders. Those were weird orders. I'm sorry. Those just plain weird. It's, it's not... Um, a, a battle strategy that that has ever been repeated. Um, you know, you don't march around <laughs> a city and shoot at it and expect it to fall down. Um, so, so that, that that was weird, and, and and Joshua followed that, and they had victory. So, why didn't Joshua check about AI? That that's that's the thing that astounds me. That, that was the next city. That was the next place 
and it's a significant city. It's it's it was it wasn't small. It was significant. Jericho was kind of like the the a, a, um, a, a royal city. It, it was very significant. Uh, AI would would have been um, close to that, and and uh, of significance. But but Joshua sent people to survey it, and and he only trusted their word. And they said, oh, we don't need the whole army. Just send us part of the army. It, it'll be fine. But things, life, life is fluid. This is the thing that we have to understand all the time. Life is fluid. This is why we have to, to, to be aware of, of, of prophecy and understand that prophecy is conditional. Just ask Jonah about that. Prophecy is conditional. Uh, and things change. And, and uh, uh you know, what we receive in a vision today, uh, you know, we, we need to be current. We need to be aware of the, the, the flow of, of the, the spirit, because although that the vision that he's going to bring it about, it may be in a way that we weren't expecting. And any of you who have had any experience of, of prophecy know that rarely does prophecy look like we imagine it's going to look. Case in point, Jesus Christ. They missed it. Because Jesus came in a way that they were not expecting. So here is Joshua. He's coming off this, this battle. He has his marching orders. It's a lesser city. Uh, he, he receives the evaluation. And like a, a good general, uh, he, he, he acts on that. But meanwhile, there's been rebellion that has entered the camp. There's been a theft of things that belong to the Lord. And Joshua's not aware of it. He would have been aware of it if he had consulted the Lord, but he didn't consult the Lord. He treated God as if he's a distant God. He, he treated him as if he was in the presence of the Lord, received marching orders, and now he goes out and does it. And we have the same attitude with Jesus Christ. We have that same attitude that he's just, he's, he's given us our marching orders. We're going out and we're doing it. And that's just how it is. But there's a reason why he's with us. There's a reason why he inhabits us. So look at what happens here in AI, in Joshua 7, 4 to 5. So about 3,000 men from the people went up in that direction. 3,000 out of their large army. 3,000 men from the people went up to that in that direction. But they fled from the men of AI. The men of AI struck down approximately 36 of them. 36 may not seem like a lot, but for Israel, 36 was a disaster. They chased them from outside the gate as far as Shebrim. They struck them down on the slope. And the hearts of the people melted and turned to water. Because Yahweh was treated like he was a distant God. And then Joshua, you know, he, he says, why have you done this to us? He's, uh, um, you know, now, now all the, all the king, all, all the nations are going to rally together. They're going to come and destroy us. So Joshua went with, uh, you know, worst possible scenario right away, you know, and, and he's complaining before God, he's laying a uh, prostrate before him and he says, God, you, you, you've got to do something about this. And, and Yahweh tells him off, get up. Get up. Why do you lie flat on your face like this? And then, matter of factly, Israel has sinned. You can read between the lines, and you would have known it if you had consulted with me. Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the things reserved for me and put them with their own things. They have stolen and kept it in a secret. The Israelites can't stand up to their enemies. They retreat before their enemies because they themselves have become a doomed thing reserved for me. I will no longer be with you unless you destroy the things reserved for me that are present among you. Because God's presence was conditioned, conditional upon their obedience. You got to keep that in mind. He, that relationship. He was faithful to them in, in uh, a long list of stuff. And the thing that only thing he asked them to be uh, you know, faithful to him about in the relationship, their part of the covenant was to be faithful to him, was, was 
their obedience. Their obedience was their faithfulness to him. To him. Um, yeah, stop and think for a moment, like what things have been disastrous in my our, in our life, and have we even consulted him about that? Have we have we found out that um, you know we we blew it because of this, or or this thing happened, or this thing was introduced? Remember there. There's a difference between prayer and intercessory prayer. Intercessors know that there's a battle going on. Intercessors know that sometimes uh, prayers um, can be interfered with, can be can be blocked. There can be, um, you know, what I mean. We look at Daniel and we, and we look at at the fact that um, the the answer was delayed uh, because uh, the angel um, w- was was under attack. And, and, he, and he needed help. He needed uh, someone. He needed wait until there was, was help uh, to come. And, and then he was freed up to come and, and, and bring the answer to Daniel. Like we have to have these things in mind that the, the enemy, uh, you know, is, is still running interference. The enemy is, is trying to uh, cause problems. And, and so intercessory prayer is really dealing with things um, that need to be battled over, uh, th- uh, you know, where, where we fight, where we fight against dark principalities so that those, those prayers um, can be answered. Those prayers can, can get through. You got to keep this in mind. So like there, we, 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 we have to keep in mind that there are sometimes the enemy's interference, you know, God wants this, but the enemy does something. He trips somebody up. He does something that suddenly uh, there's there's a barrier there. Of course, AI was one of the cities that needed to be destroyed, but rebellion had entered the camp, and and Yahweh was not able to use Israel for His purposes as long as there was rebellion there. So the rebellion had to be taken care of. Makes sense. Look at what Jesus said to us. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. Without me, you can't do anything. What happened at Ai? They went up without the Lord. What happens when we're we're in a self-help mode? We don't consult the Lord. Then we can't do anything. Not anything that's of any worth, not anything that's going to have any, um, you know, eternal longevity. There, 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 is, there is real purpose in us maintaining this intimacy with the Lord. It's, it's not optional. Without him, we can't do anything. And, and it's not intimacy to go uh, a, a few days uh, leaving him out of it, of everything, and then when we realize that it's beyond us, then trying to bring him into it. Now, there's always his grace. Okay, his grace is significant. It's fantastic. It's it's wonderful. But we shouldn't we shouldn't have to get there. And how much time are we wasting? How inefficient are we? Because we know how to do something, so we just do it. but it doesn't have the anointing. And we know without the anointing, there's no value. So when they, when they, when they took care of what they had to take care of, um, the Lord said to, to Joshua, don't be afraid or terrified. He's back to that place again. Okay, you blew it, but it's taken care of. So now don't be afraid or terrified. Take the entire army with you. Yeah, don't be a show off. Take the entire army with you. Start to go up to AI. Look, I've given the king of AI, his people, his city, and his land into your power. See, he's re- re- right there. Right there. I'm telling you, when you know the Lord's will, when you know that you're in his will, when you receive those promises, you can step out in boldness. But when you know you're guessing at it, when you know you haven't you haven't taken the time, when you know that you're in a weak place in the relationship, I suggest that you stand still. I, I really suggest before you make any decisions 
that you get that relationship renewed. Don't do it because it just seems like a logical thing. Don't do it because it seems right. Do it because you know that that's the direction that he's given to you. Do to AI and its king what you did to Jericho and its king. But you may take its booty and cattle as plunder. And then he receives the instructions for the battle. Set your ambush behind the city. And just like Jericho, the Lord gives Joshua the instructions for this battle. Okay, so it makes sense, right? Joshua clues in. Okay, now I gotta, I just gotta, you know, Yahweh is here with me. I have access to him. Uh, I, I need to consult him more. This is a good thing to do, right? Well, some of us are slow learners. Okay, I categorize myself there because there are so many lessons I've had to relearn. And Joshua goes from the thing at AI to the Gibeonites. And um, again, you, you can't you can't fault the Gibeonites. They 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 know they they when, when Joshua later confronts them says, Why did you lie to me? For me, that's one of the dumbest questions that there is in the Bible. Um, they lied because they wanted to stay alive is why they lied. And, and they knew, they repeated to him that they knew that, that Yahweh had given them the land. They knew that they had a, a, a death um, uh, warrant on them. Uh, they knew that they were, they were going to be wiped out. They knew it. So they, they were desperate and they, they pulled off uh, some deception and, and they did it because Joshua did not consult. Joshua didn't consult. If he had consulted, the Lord would have let him know that they were just the next town over. They were the next one on the list, but they acted as if they were from a distant country. And so we read the, Isra the Israelites took some of their supplies because they were said they came from a, uh, a distant country, um, but they had just put stale food in, the, in their saddlebags. The Israelites took some of their supply, but they didn't, they didn't ask for any decision from the Lord. They didn't ask any decision from the Lord. Joshua made peace with them. He made a treaty with them to protect their lives. The leaders of the community made a solemn pledge to them. And right there, that's a completely different lesson. But just pointing out, even though it's the Lord's will that they be destroyed because of all you know, 400 years of deprivation and rebellion and, and, and all that they had done, these are people who would sacrifice their children to their, to their idols and, and so on. So don't think that these are, are nice people. You know, and so it's his will that they're wiped out, but look at the power of a promise. This is how important the promise is to our father. I want you to understand that. That's how important his promises are to him. When he says something, he'll never go back on it. The fact that he's never given up on us is because he made a decision to love us and promised to love us. He'll never stop loving us because he promised to love us. And in this case, because a solemn pledge, a solemn promise was made to the Gibeonites, they were not allowed to go back on it. And the Gibeonites remained in the history of Israel, and they were the woodcutters and water bearers for the temple. Interesting. So we can't afford to live with a distant God mentality. We can't. We can't live. We can't afford to live with a distant God mentality. Just want you to just 
to stop and think about that. Have I been treating, have I been treating Jesus as if he isn't here with me? Am I, am I treating him? Do I ignore him most of my day? Do I ignore him for days on end? Like, is he real to me? Do I have conversation with him? Do I, do I talk things over with him? Do I consult with him? Just some things to remember. We're on his mission and not our own. We're given assignments, but he gives us the assignments. It's his mission. It's not, it's not our idea. It's, it's not our mission to save the world. It's not our mission to get as many people onto the, to the lifeboat as possible. It's, it's, it's his. And, and, and because of that, we follow his instructions in this mission because it's his mission. It's like, it, it, it's, it's like the regular soldiers in an army. Okay, they're involved with with these these battles and with the with the war but it's it's the it's the general's war it's his war he gives he sees the overall picture he knows everything that's going on and he gets to make the decision of who he sacrifices and who he saves and and who's going to be important here and who won't be so important there it's like that's all that general and and this is this is jesus we have to remember that so we're, we're kind of really not very intelligent when we lose contact with the general. It's very important for us to understand that we can't do anything um, without him. That's really, really important for us to understand. We can do things that look good. It, it's, it's like... <laughs> it's, like, it's like you bought a house you don't know how to fix the house um you know you don't bother contacting a contractor um uh, you know who can who can fix the house you're just gonna you're gonna slap a coat of paint over it right and make it look good you know and a few years later the walls are falling down and the plumbing's bursting and, and all that sort of stuff because because you couldn't do it and and this is what it's like Jesus doesn't call us to what we can do. He, he, he calls us to what he's given us the anointing for, because he's going to do that through us. This is something we have to keep in mind all the time. It's something, what, what he calls us to is what he's going to accomplish through us. It isn't according to our, our ability or our talents or anything else. It's according to him. So he, if he's called you to that, um, you know, lose that whole idea that he'll he'll never call me to anything that I can't handle. Wrong. He he always will call you to something you can't handle, because it's not for you to handle. It's for him to accomplish through you. We need to know his voice, because we need daily instruction. We we can't afford this idea of well, I've given my. I've been given my marching orders and off I go. I'll, I'll see what I can do with this. Not at all. He's not like that. We, we never grow to a point of maturity where we don't need him. It doesn't work that way. Our maturity uh, has us more dependent on him, not less. Because with maturity become, comes the understanding that we need him. We can't accomplish anything without him. And, and so we lean more into him, not less into him. We need his daily instruction. We need to be listening because we're not always aware what the assignment's going to be today. We may not know it until it's on us. We may not know it until we come across it. And then when we're attentive, when we're listening to the spirit and we see that thing, the spirit is either going to prompt us or we're going to ask the spirit. We're going to say, Am I, should I be involved with this? And we'll get the yes or no. Or he may just tell us right away. Jump in. Now, I'm not talking about meeting the needs of your neighbor. That, that's a given. The word tells us if we have the means, um, then, then we need to give. Okay, I'm not talking about that. I'm, I'm talking about sometimes when, when you, you have that sense of um, 
evil, when you have that sense of depression, when you walk into a room, I mean, that's just, that's just one little example where you can look around and, and say, Lord, is, am I supposed to be involved with this? And, and he says, no, I've got this covered. And you just move on well, to whatever the assignment's going to be. Uh, it, it's, and, and sometimes when you're called to specific things, that's what you're going to spend most of your time. When you have those gifts, like the gift of encouragement, you're going to find yourself throughout the day in all, so many opportunities that you're using that gift, that gift to lift up, to encourage, to, to help people. You know, when you have the gift of helps, you're going to find that a lot of your day is filled with that, doing small things for people behind the scenes. You know, there, there's that, but that, that doesn't take away from the fact that we need to check with him. Am I supposed to be involved with this person? Is this, is this something I'm supposed to be? Because sometimes when we're not paying attention, we can get involved with the wrong person and give the wrong encouragement or an encouragement that shouldn't be given at that time because that's not our assignment. We're operating in the gift, but that's not the assignment. And so we, we can make that person's recovery that much longer because the wrong thing was given at the wrong time. Can you imagine how complicated all of this is? Not complicated to him, but we just can't imagine with how all these different interactions um, uh, result in, in, in things that, that come out of it. It's, 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 and and there's, there's like 8 billion people on the planet and all these interactions and just beyond us to even think about. We have to remember that life is a thing in motion. Constantly, it's constantly moving. It's in motion. Things are not stagnant. You know, things result from you not doing something or from you doing something. It's going to have ripple effects one way or the other. Things change. Plans get adjusted. Not his overall will. Nothing can frustrate his will. But how he brings about that will can change because you didn't step in where you were supposed to step in or you interfered where you shouldn't have interfered. Now, this isn't to get everybody paranoid, but we need to pay attention. We, 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 <laughs> we need direction. We need direction. And don't, have this thing in your mind where you're going to have to sit there in in meditation for for hours on end to know whether you're going to wh whether you should drink a, a glass of juice or not. We're, we're not not talking about that. There there are some big things that we need to check with him about. There are there are things that we're in you know, in prayer about. It's but the daily living stuff, the stuff that we're going to spend most of our time doing. Those are things that are on the spot. Those are the things that we need to be open to him. Those are the things where we need to understand that he's not distant, that he's walking with us. He's here right now. You have to kind of have in your mind that Jesus walking beside you all the time. And you can turn to him and say, do we get involved with this? It's good to use the we. <laughs> do, we do we get involved with this? And have the expectation that he's going to respond to you right there. It's a lot. But we, we need to understand what it really looks like to follow Jesus. Take up your cross. You know, deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Follow me, he said. He didn't tell us to get ahead of him. He didn't tell us to, there you go, go on. And when he told us to go, when he told us to go to the nations, he emphasized, and I am with you. And I am with you. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me.
if we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit. I am sorry that, that COVID has, has played these games on our mind. And I'll tell you, I, I, under, I understand. I understand it's going to take us a while to, to recover. I, I understand it's going to take um, some, some rewiring of our brain because our, our brain has been rewired by COVID and we need the Holy Spirit just to restore the proper, proper wiring in our brain. And I understand um, that you, you can, it's not fear that may keep us from gathering as often as we know we, we should but often it's tiredness. There's a, there's a tiredness. There's a mental tiredness that where you're finding yourself not having the energy um, to be together because relationship takes energy. Gathering takes energy. And, and before, we, we may have had it in bucket loads. Not everybody did, but, but most of us did. And we really looked forward and we couldn't wait. There was anticipation of being getting together for our prayer meetings and, and on Sunday. Um, but right now, you know, when you, when you go gather and come home and you're exhausted, um, it, it's not just because of, of stuff that's going on in your life. It, it's because, and give yourself a break. It's because you're mentally tired and our society is, and there's an ugliness that has come in. And there's division that has come in. And there's so much that has come in that is, is causing us, um, as much as we say we want to be together, um, not to have the energy to actually be together. And, and, and knowing that, then, we can seek healing in it. So these reminders that the Spirit is giving us right now of what relationship really looks like with him, uh, sometimes we're too tired to engage with him and we can't afford that. And right now, I just really want to encourage you to, to do what we were talking about last week and, and uh, lay down in the meadows. Walk beside those quiet waters. Just spend even time with him in silence. You know, there, there, was, there was the, the whole soaking Remember, we used to talk about that, that soaking, and, and uh, some people thought it was ridiculous, but just sitting um, with, with, um, with scripture being read or with, with worship being sung or um, just anointed music being played, and it's in this place, it's in, that it's in the meadows, it's, it's by the quiet waters um, throughout the day throughout the day to, to just connect, connect like I was talking about this morning, it, that the whole connection, the whole being aware, the whole just stopping and taking some deep breaths and listening for him, um, anticipating, feeling him, uh, allowing his thoughts to wash over you, and just that awareness, just that awareness to hear his sounds to hear his sounds, to feel his breath, to smell his presence. This is really what we need. This is where we're, this is where we're going to find renewal. This is where we're going to find the strength being renewed. And, and uh, we, we need to pray for that sound mind. There, there's some of you who uh, are, are either depressed and don't know it, or you're borderline and depressed and don't know it, but there, there are things that have happened. We have experienced uh, a, a trauma in our society that we're not stopping to consider um, very much at all. Uh, the reason people are rebelling the way that they are, the way it comes across with anger and, and hatred is because of this tiredness and they're trying to fight back, but it's, it's not done in the way it needs to be done. And even those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ, 
they, they may not understand the way that they've been rewired and, and what they're actually doing is dishonoring our father. But it's coming from a place of pain. It's coming from a place of hurt. It's coming from a place of trauma. These are the things that we need to be aware of. But we can't be aware of it and then not act on it. We can't be aware of it and just say, well, my day is too busy. I can't do that. For the sake of your life, for, for the sake of your relationship with the Lord, for the sake of our, the mission, for the sake of our communities, we, we have no choice. We have to do this. There's, he, there's, there's no healing any other way. We have to do this. We have to live in the reality of the fact that he dwells in us. And we dwell in him, and we need to experience healing there. I, I, I wish we were all together right at this moment. And, and I understand why we're not, but I wish we were. There's value in us individually, just sitting in his presence. Just do it every day. Absolutely. But we know what it's like, and we've experienced those incredible moments where together we have sat in his presence. And we've just let him talk. Father, I'm so happy that we're not just soldiers to you. I'm so happy that we're your children. I'm so happy for your faithfulness uh, to your promises towards us. I, I, I'm so thankful that you just, you're just interested in us. That the whole reason that there's a mission is because you're interested in us that you love us. The whole reason that we're still on this planet, that we're still alive in this place, is because you love the world. We're involved in a mission, not to punish people, but to see them saved from eternal destruction. So thankful that you're just a dad who loves his children. And the greatest gift we can give to you is time. Please forgive us. Forgive us for being neg neglectful children. Being so busy with the family business that we've oftentimes neglected the relationship. There is no family business without relationship. We have nothing to show this world without relationship. Because without relationship, there's no, there's no sense living these actions, doing these things. It's always about relationship with you. Forgive us for failing. And I know you easily do and readily do. But we don't want to, we don't want to just apologize and, and seek your forgiveness and, and walk away. We're asking that you would rewire, rewire those pathways. Show us the habits that we need to have in place to assist with those pathways. Help us to hear your voice 
even just a little bit so we know the direction to walk in. Help us again to treat you like you are here with us and that you love us and that you, you desire us and that, that, oh, Lord. I pray for those right now who aren't even aware that they need this renewal. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would, you would be that comfort that they need right now, that they, sometimes when we're out in the cold for so long that we forget how cold it is till we step into the warm house. Spirit, I ask that you would open the door that they could feel the warmth radiating from that door that would provoke memory so they they don't understand how cold they actually are, how much they need you. Holy Spirit. You know the needs of each and every one of us, but I pray that we will have the courage to speak those needs out loud to you right now. With the understanding and the expectation that you intend to respond to those needs. And I pray that we will will really decide in our hearts that we will not dishonor you and disrespect you, that we will not ignore you, and that we would we begin to understand the value of just hanging out with you. Paul said that without love, that he he is nothing and that he has nothing. Even before we look at loving each other, the first love has to be you. So, Lord, teach us how to love you. Teach us the respect that is there in that love. I pray that you would renew us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I pray for the unspoken needs, Lord, the ones that we're not, that are on people's hearts that uh, for some reason were not spoken this morning. Uh, that are not on our prayer list, Lord, and that you know uh, what they are and who they are. We just pray for those things right now, that they would be brave enough uh, to sit down and, and discuss it with you and, and uh, to see you work it out in them. And you are so glad to respond to all of our needs, all of our desires, all of our wants. And I pray that we would be just brave enough to believe that that is true, that that is true. I pray for uh, just our, our, our conversation now, Lord, our time of fellowship. I pray for um, all the churches in Montreal at this moment, the renewal is going on in this way. Uh, we pray, Lord, that your fire be fall upon us. Um, sometimes people think that that's fire and brimstone, but the fire that is the courage to step out and, and operate in what you've committed, uh, told us to operate in, what you've given us to operate in, always in love, always with compassion. Um, no fear, just in boldness and in truth, and uh, to demonstrate um, to the world our love for each other. Sometimes that, that, takes, that takes more courage than anything else, to be willing to love each other in all of our messes. So thank you, Lord, and uh, we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let me just... Thank everybody for coming and listening in today. Uh, Have a good day. God bless.